Hey, welcome to church. My name is Corey. And my name is Terry, and we're a couple of the pastors here at Riverside Community Church, a community where everyone belongs Everybody. and many believe. Do I belong? Yes, absolutely you do. And Corey, we've got something uh, a little bit different in worship today. Why don't you tell us about how people can connect, and then we'll go into what we have in store for today. Absolutely. You're watching this at home, and you've got the opportunity right now to invite someone else to watch along with you. It's never going to get simpler to invite somebody to church. So grab your phone, call someone, message them, and just say, hey, join me at our side online, and they can watch along and see what church is like from the safety of their own home. There's also three ways that they can connect. Instagram, Facebook, the usual social media platforms. Uh, you can connect today in the service with our live chat, either for prayer or just to, to connect with other people. And of course, in person, Monday to Friday, nine to three. Now you may also be wondering, why are these guys standing in an empty stage today? And part of that, if, if we didn't have a plan, it might be that you were about to witness one of the most uncomfortable moments in Riverside history as I publicly fire Pastor Corey for not having prepared worship. But, but that's not the case. No. Not the case. What, what do we have going on today, Pastor Corey? Riverside Community Church is a church that really believes in empowering the young people of this generation. Amen, we do. You're talking to two uh, former youth pastors. Well, let's be honest, we're still <laughs> youth pastors. <laughs> and we love seeing when the younger generation steps up to the plate. Pacific Life Bible College is the Bible college for Foursquare Canada. And they have graciously put together over the last couple of months a set of worship that they offered to each of the individual churches in Canada. We decided what a great way to uh, be able to put a platform out so you can see what we get to see quite often. Absolutely. And that is the beautiful stuff that's going on with our Bible college. They're gonna be leading us in worship here this morning. And so with that in mind, we prepare our hearts to worship. In a few moments at the conclusion of our service, we're going to be having communion together. So you want to get the elements ready to do that. It's very important we do that. And we're also going to have the privilege of hearing from our Foursquare National President, Steve Faulkner. So we're going to do that together. So why don't we pray now to posture our hearts to receive the fullness of what God has for us in worship yes. through the PLBC uh, worship team. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment. I'm just, I'm blown away that we still have the privilege of uh, worshiping uh, in, in freedom here in yeah. Canada. Lord, we, we think of many people around the world who, who don't have this privilege, uh, but we, we still have it. It's restricted to a degree, but it's not restricted at all because you are who you are. And so Father, I pray in every household right now, every device that is, is watching and sharing these things, Lord, that your spirit would be profoundly present, that each one of us would be drawn into a deeper and more loving embrace of God our Father. And so Father, now we give you these moments as we submit our hearts in worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, church, as you worship today.
Just in his righteousness alone Faultless we'll stand before the throne Let's sing it again When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless we'll stand before the throne Hallelujah Cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree Body bound, drenched in tears, then laid him down and draws into the entrance by heavy stone, Messiah still and all.
shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face days we will sing your praise. I, God, I, I can't picture what that looks like, but I've got the sense that because you say that it is going to be good. So thanks for the practice run that we get to do here on earth. Thank you for our Bible college. We release your blessing over them and all that they're up to, and also what you've got in store for the rest of this service here. In your precious name, amen. So be it. We're going to move to our offering and giving. Scripture that I've got for us today is from Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Now, take into account who gets to be in charge of the reciprocation that happens in this verse. It goes like this. Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and pouring into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you give back. So God, in this place, in this time, we, we accept your dare to try to outgive you, knowing full well there's not a chance we can do it. But thanks for the opportunity to really look like your people in all of the aspects of our lives by taking this into account. In your precious name, amen. Well, there's a number of ways that you can give if you decide to give here today. You can give online. If you're on our side dot online right now, there's a give button. If you're on Facebook, there should be something popping up in the chat, which will take you to our giving page. There's e-transfers and different ways of doing that. If you're an in-person giver, come on down to the office from nine o'clock to three o'clock, Monday to Fridays, and we can do your giving by online, debit, credit, checks, however that works for you. I got my t-shirts and shorts. Can't forget shorts. It's going to be hot in Costa Rica. Uh, Alicia? Hey, Manila. What are you doing? I'm packing for our mission trip next year, spring break 2021. Can't be too prepared. Yeah, okay, but you know we can't travel to another country for spring break 2021. We, we can't travel out of the country? So there's no mission trip next year? Now, hold on, hold on. We still get to do missions. We don't need to go far to make a difference. There's a lot of opportunities in our local communities and in our province to help those in need. You're right, you're so true. Because there's a lot of people here in BC that could use our help. Exactly, and think about it, COVID-19, who has it impacted the most? Our senior citizens. We have an opportunity with Hawthorne Care mm -hmm. to be able to help this facility fundraise for equipment that our seniors need and also do some spring cleaning outside, which will be safe with social distancing. So even with the restrictions in place, if there's still restrictions in place, we could do this safely as a team. So true. 
We also have an opportunity with a transition home for women called mm -hmm. Talitha Coom, and we get to help refurbish rooms for them and do some decoration and yeah. just give these women who desperately need our help a beautiful place to stay. Yeah, and we're gonna have a lot of fun doing it together yeah. as a team. During spring break, come together, help make a difference in your community. We wanna leave a legacy, Riverside Youth. So what do we gotta do, Alicia? So we gotta save the date. I'm gonna save it and you should save it. So January 15th, Yes. youth, if you're in high school, grades eight to 12, join us. Come on. We're gonna have our first info meeting that day and registration will open up to join us on this wonderful trip. So we're excited. We hope you are gonna get excited for spring break 2021. We can't go far, but we have opportunities near us to make a difference. So see you in the new year. Happy new year. We love you guys. See you there. Well, speaking of new and all things new, uh, there's a new opportunity for our art gallery and all of our artists in the church. Um, a new exhibit on the theme of giving is coming together. And as we continue through this season of physical distancing, recognizing that we are created to be giving as our father is, we are created in his image. It's an important part of who we are and it's good to turn our attention from things we are not able to do at this time to what we can do and that is give. This is for all ages, anything that represents giving. This can even be a photo and a written story about someone. We want to hear your giving stories and see creative rep representation. Please share and let's fill the gallery. Art is to be completed and dropped off by January the 15th. And a big thanks to Pastor Lori for curating our gallery. Every year about this time, the uh, Foursquare Gospel Church of Canada invites all churches across Canada to participate together in a unified expression of prayer and fasting, and this year is no different. And I think there's a timeliness about our participation this year. Just so you know, the dates are January 11th through 17th, and uh, we as a church have decided to uh, indeed participate with the rest of the uh, body in Canada. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce to you uh, President Steve Faulkner, who is going to provide that further invitation and, uh, and a message regarding this, the spiritual discipline of fasting. Some of you might be unfamiliar with that. I know many of you have fasted before, but this is probably the first time as a church where our entire church is being called into a partnership with the entire church in Canada. Uh, he does a very good job in this message of explaining the kind of the uh, framework of how fasting works and how it doesn't work. And when we're done with that message, we will conclude with communion and I'll meet you back here in about 25 minutes or so. God bless you as we listen to the ministry of President Steve Faulkner. Hi everyone, this is Steve Faulkner, and I'd like to wish you a very happy new year. I hope your new year is off to a really good start. And if it's not, there's something that I want to invite you to participate in that's guaranteed to get you off to a great start for this coming year. And that thing that I'm inviting you to participate in is Foursquare Canada's annual week of prayer and fasting. We do this every year and there's so many testimonies that we receive about what a wonderful time people have had fasting and praying and what God has done through those periods of time. Now some of you have not maybe fasted before and you might not be that familiar with fasting, so I'll give you a bit of a primer, a little bit of an explanation about what fasting is. Well, biblical fasting, which is what we're talking about, is simply going without food. Sounds simple, but there's different ways that you can go about doing that. One of the ways that people do it is to cut out a certain type of food out of their diet for the week of prayer and fasting. Maybe they'll give up caffeine for the week. 
you imagine a week without your daily Starbucks or that boost of caffeine getting you going in the morning? Uh, for some people, that would be a real challenge. Other people, they might give up sweets and meat for the week and be some kind of a, a vegetarian for that week. And, and so they modify their diet, sacrificing certain things out of their diet during that week of prayer and fasting. Other people, they may fast breakfast or they may fast breakfast and lunch. And uh, there's some people who would even fast entire days during that week, drinking only water during those periods of time. Well, some people may be thinking, you know, I, I'm not sure that I could do that because of my work or my health. And so there are other ways that you can go about fasting. For one thing, people sometimes fast technology, giving up your smartphone, your media, even your TV for an entire week. Can you imagine using your, your phone only to make phone calls? <laughs> that would be quite a, a different thing for a lot of people. And that's one, another way they can go about fasting. Well, it's a time of year when we're doing different things that uh, we're making resolutions, getting in shape or losing weight or achieving something during this year. And one thing I've discovered is that we need some really good motivation in order to carry us through. Not only do we need to make the decision that we want to do it, but we need the motivation to carry it through as well. And so I want to share with you a little truth, a reason why you should fast, something that you're going to get out of fasting that's going to motivate you and not only motivate you to start, but motivate you to carry you through and make you even want to participate in this week of prayer and fasting. Well, I'll tell you a little story first. Years ago, our family were missionaries in Sri Lanka and we had some Canadian friends who were there and our Canadian friends said, hey, Steve and Andy, would you like to go on a, a hike with us? We're like, oh, that sounds like fun. Tell us more about it. They said, well, we want to go and climb up Adam's Peak. And so what we need to do is we're going to be going up to this mountain. We'll be staying overnight in a guest house. Well, not really staying overnight, actually, because about one o'clock in the morning, we need to head to the base of the peak. And from there, we're going to be climbing up in the dark. I'm thinking, oh, so far, this doesn't sound that fun. We're missing a night's sleep. We're climbing in the dark. I mean, what are you going to, what beautiful views are you going to have in the dark from this peak? And they said, I said, well, is it safe to climb up in the dark? And they said, oh yeah, it's like a, it's built almost like a stairway all the way up to the peak. And it'll take about three hours and uh, your legs will be pretty rubbery when you get to the top. And not only that, but if you come, you need to bring something warm because the temperature at the top is a lot different than the temperature was down at the bottom. So here we are, miss a night's sleep, climb up in the dark, three hours of stair climbing with rubbery legs, sitting in the cold. So far, I'm not hooked. I don't have a lot of motivation to want to do this. But then he said, the reason we're going up there is we're going to sit and we're going to wait for the sunrise. And when you see the sun come up, it first peaks up and you see the colors spread across the horizon and then start to reflect off the mountains. And there's a, a lake down below that you can see. And actually from up there, it's pretty much a 360 degree view around the peak. And you can see off in every direction, different areas of Sri Lanka. He said, it's absolutely stunning. Well, with that, he had me hooked. I wanted to go. I wanted to participate in this hike because of what I could see at the end of it, this view. And not only that, the, the fellowship of our friends in the process. And so we did it and it was great. So motivation is something that we need to find to carry through the things that we decide to do. When it comes to a week of prayer and fasting, you need to have a motivation to do it. And I want to tell you what your motivation could be, should be, that's going to not only get you through it, but it's going to get you the big reward at the end. Because when it comes to fasting, it's not just finding a reason to do it, but you've got to find the right reason to do it. This is a, a principle with biblical fasting. If you do it for the wrong reason, you get some small reward related to your reason, but you miss out on the big reward. And I want you to have the big reward. So in order to kind of cut our way through to that, we first need to talk about how we shouldn't be going into a week of prayer and fasting, why we shouldn't be doing it. And one of the reasons we shouldn't be doing it is purely out of a sense of duty. Just because your pastor says that we're having a week of prayer and fasting isn't really a good enough reason to do it, or because the president's inviting you to participate in a week of prayer and fasting, that's not a good enough reason to do it. 
In the Bible, there's nowhere that we're commanded to fast. That, you know, Jesus doesn't say that, well, you must fast and I command you to fast. And there's nowhere that I find that Christians, followers of Christ, are commanded to fast in the Bible. But I do find that every significant character has periods of fasting within their lives and ministries. Why do they do it? If it's not a command, why would they want to do it? There must be some reason, some kind of a hook that carries them through that makes them not only do it, but want to do it if it's not there in the form of a command. So we don't fast because it's a duty. If you do it just because it's a duty, well, you can check that off your list. Hey, I did my duty and I, you know, did what I was meant to do. If that's your motivation, that's your reward. You don't get the big reward. Well, another reason that you shouldn't be fasting is something that I found myself slip into a few times. There's been fasts that I've been in when I, I lose my way a little bit and lose my purpose. And, and I think, well, at least maybe I'll, I'll lose a little bit of weight in the process. And I know that I'm getting into this when I'm going and I'm stepping on the scales every morning and maybe even twice a day I'm looking at the scales, you know, seeing if the numbers are going down, hoping I'm going to at least, at least lose a little bit of weight in this process. And there is a form of dieting that uses fasting. It's called intermittent fasting and people do that to lose weight. And if that's your goal, then that's your reward is you'll lose a little bit of weight, but you'll miss out on the big reward of biblical fasting. So. Don't do it as a diet. Don't do it as a sense of duty. Um, another little kind of, there was a time when I was off again, but not in a huge way. It was in one of the first churches that I pastored. And I'd read this book where they had encouraged you to fast and pray for your church, that it was going to do great things for your church. And so I thought, well, you know, I want great things to happen for the people in my church. So I'm going to do some fasting and praying. And so I did it secretly. It was like an experiment. Um, I fasted and prayed. Of course, my wife knew. It's hard not you know, for your wife to not know that you're, you're not eating. And, but nobody else knew. And then I would just go about business as usual. We'd have our services. We'd have our prayer meetings. We'd do the things that we normally did. But God started to do things during those periods of fast. One thing was people would spontaneously just start showing up at the church. Nobody invited them. They just came. They found out about the church and, and there they were and the church started to grow. Um, we also saw people that were set free of emotional bondages that they had. They'd been carrying these things for years. And it was like the, the presence, the anointing of God was very strong there and broke through for these people for, so that they were set free from these things. Uh, we also, we were seeing people getting saved during those periods of time. And I started to think to myself, hey, this is great. This is a great church growth technique, this prayer and fasting. I mean, uh, you know, and I started to talk to people that way. And then it was like Jesus gave me a little bit of a rebuke. And he said, fasting is not a formula. I'm not a vending machine that you put in the, the right number of coins and then you push the buttons and out comes your result. I'm not a vending machine. I'm a person. So don't fall into the trap that I did and treat fasting like a formula to get what you want from God. It's not a, it's not a formula where we treat him like a vending machine. Um, we have a relationship with God. We don't try to manipulate him. In fact, there's nothing that we can do to manipulate him or make him feel like he owes us something. Well, Jesus, he also taught about fasting and he, uh, he told us a reason that we shouldn't fast. And he said, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. Now I'll explain that word a little bit if you're not familiar with it. A hypocrite is someone who puts on a show for others to see. What their main concern is, is with impressing the crowds, impressing those people that are looking on. And so it's important that you notice that I'm fasting. And so in Jesus' day, these religious people who did this, they would dress up in these tattered clothes and they would put ashes on their head, even smear them on their face and on their arms. And then they would go and they would stand in the marketplace so that people would see them and everybody knew, hey, he's fasting. What a devout person. What a spiritual person they must be. A great example for all of us. And then they would also go to the synagogue dressed like that. It was like the church of the day so that other people would see them and be impressed by them. Jesus said, if your goal is to impress other people with your fasting, that's your reward. But you're going to miss out on the big reward if that's what your motive is. 
You know, I've also found that it may not be that I'm trying to impress other people, but that it's possible to fast trying to impress myself. Jesus told another story about a, a man, a Pharisee, one of the religious people of the day, who he stood praying before God and he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Obviously thinking in his heart, I'm a bit better than other people. And then he went on to explain why. I tithe a tenth of all that I get. You know, tithing was like giving to the church in those days. And I fast twice a week. It was like he was patting himself on the back for his own self-discipline, for his own self-righteousness. Now, hopefully I haven't fallen into exactly the same trap as that, but what I've fallen into is, you know, I commit myself to pray and fast for a week. And sometimes during the week, it gets really difficult. You know, I'm invited to go somewhere where I'm expected to eat or, or I'm feeling weak or, or just the, the odors coming from restaurants are just super tempting and I start to salivate. And it seems difficult to push through, but I think, no, I committed myself to a week of this. I'm gonna push through and I'm gonna do it. And I get to the end of the week and I've stuck to my fast and I think, well done, you got it done. I'm kind of impressed with myself that I managed to stick to it. Well, once again, the motive's wrong. If your motive is to impress yourself, well, you might be impressed with your own self-discipline, but you're gonna miss out on the real reward because the real reward takes a pure motive in order to receive it. So then Jesus went on, and this is in Matthew chapter six where he's teaching his disciples, told them not to be like the hypocrites, but what he told them is he said, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it won't be obvious to others that you're fasting. Really what he was saying in today's language is, you know, dress properly, do yourself up the way you would every day, look good, look normal, so that no one who looks at you is gonna know that you're fasting. Don't put on a show like the hypocrites do. Make sure that you don't do that. So that won't be obvious to others you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. Now, I want to pause there with that term Jesus used for God, your father. It wasn't generic God or, or something like that, but he said your father. And not even just father, but your father. It was a, a term of intimacy. It was a term of relationship. And that's the kind of attitude that we're to have towards God when we approach him in fasting. We're not trying to wrestle something out of his hands, but we're going to a, lo a loving father who loves to reward the right attitudes of hearts. As children, we all do some, some things that, that are naughty that we probably shouldn't do. And our kids were, were the, just the same. I mean, I love our daughters, very proud of them both. Super people, really great people. But, you know, as, as kids, they, they sometimes did things that they shouldn't do. And, and one of our daughters was out shopping with Andy. He's just a little girl at the time and went into the shop that had some toys and candies and things. And, and my daughter found these clacky teeth, you know, those ones you wind up and clack, 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 clack. Well, she saw these and she decided that she wanted them. And so, mommy, I want these. And no, you can't have them. But I want them, I want them. No, you can't have them, put them back. And then Andy continued her shopping, paid the, the shopkeeper for what she had. And, and off she went walking down the street with my daughter. And partway down the street, my daughter reached into her pocket. Yeah, and you guessed it, and out came the clacky teeth. And she said, ha ha. Well, how do you think Andy responded? She said, what did you do? Did you steal that? You can't take something from a store without paying for it. We have to take that back. And my daughter was upset and she took those clacky teeth and threw them down and smashed them on the ground. Well, that didn't dissuade Andy. She picked up those broken clacky teeth and she took my daughter in hand and marched back to that shop, went to the shopkeeper and said, my daughter has an apology to make to you. Say sorry to the man. And he looked and he said, oh, it's okay. You know, these are broken now. Let me go and get her some other ones. It's fine. And what do you think my wife did? She said, no, I don't want to reward bad attitude and bad behavior. You know, she's not getting any other ones. She needs to apologize to you. We're gonna pay for them and then we're leaving. And that's what parents are like. We like to reward good behavior and good attitudes and we, we don't want to reward bad attitudes and bad behavior. Well, our Heavenly Father is the same towards us. Well, 
When it comes to fasting, the way that this plays in is that fasting is an attitude to God that says all of the kind of things that God loves to hear. Um, and because of that, Jesus said that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He sees what's going on inside of your heart and he will reward you. The force of that statement is really coming across as a promise. And this is really the hook. This is really the thing that motivates me to fast and that I'm excited about participating in a week of prayer and fasting about is because my Heavenly Father is going to reward me when my motive, when my attitude towards Him is right, that that reward is going to be there. And it comes across not as a if or maybe, but Jesus said He will reward you. It, it comes across with a force of a promise. And the reason is because it says all the right type of things to our fathers. It says, I'm serious about this thing that I'm fasting about. And we know that God doesn't reveal himself to the casual inquirer. But he said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And fasting is a great expression of seeking God with all of your heart. And when we do that, the Father is pleased with that kind of attitude that, that we're in this with our whole heart. We're serious about it. And he loves to reward that kind of attitude of heart. Another thing that it says to him is, I can't do this on my own. Or maybe you think you can do it on your own. And it would say, well, and even if I could do it on my own, Lord, I don't want to. I want to do it with your help. I need your help and I want to do it with your help. Kind of like Moses in the Old Testament when he said to God, God, if you're not going to go with us, don't send us forth from here. Don't make us go if your presence isn't going to be there with us. And what father's heart doesn't melt when their child says, I don't want to do it if you're not going to do it with me. I want you to do it along with me as well. Another thing that, that fasting expresses to the father is the thing that I'm sacrificing during this week is not as important as you are to me. Whatever I'm giving up, is of far less importance than you, whether it's giving up my, my Tim Hortons coffee and, and sour cream glazed donut or, or my Five Guys burger or you know being on keeping up on Facebook and being the first to post things or, or whatever it is, whatever I'm sacrificing is not as important as you are. You're more important than all of those kind of things. And again, what father, what parent doesn't love to hear from their child that, hey, you're more important than all these other distractions in our life. The passage affirms the father's heart so strongly that those words come across as a promise that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what shape does that reward take? Let's look in the Bible and see it, people who fasted and see what shape their reward took. Think about Moses. Moses fasted and he went to meet with God. And it says that God's presence was so powerful, came down around him and, and it was just so powerful there that when he came down from the mountain, that people looked at him and he looked different. There was something about him, even that, like there was a radiance that came from his face just because of his great experience of God's presence. And that's one of the things that, that we can be rewarded with is God's presence as we enter into times of fasting and prayer. The prophet Elijah, during a time of, of discouragement and depression, he fasted on the way to this mountain to meet with God, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And when he was there, he heard from God and he had a great breakthrough from his discouragement. And from that point on, things changed for him. It was a, a change in direct um, trajectory from this, this whole period of discouragement to something brand new. Or think about the Old Testament lead, leader, Nehemiah. Nehemiah saw that the, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and his heart was broken because of that. And he decided that he was going to go and he was going to oversee and see to it that those walls were rebuilt. So what he did was he fasted and he prayed. And as a result of that, God gave him favor all along the way. He needed favor with the king. He needed favor with people who were suppliers, favor with workers, favor with so many things. And God granted him favor as he fasted before undertaking this new venture. The prophet Daniel fasted and God gave him the understanding, the interpretation of something that was very perplexing to him, something that, that he couldn't understand and was weighing him down. Jesus fasted and, 
And one thing that happened was he overcame the, the temptation that came from Satan during that time. But something that really sticks with me is that when Jesus returned from that period of fasting, it says that he returned in the power of the Spirit. Would you like to have more of the power of the Spirit operating in your life and in your ministry? Well, fasting is one of the things that, that did that for Jesus. Paul and the church in Antioch fasted and worshiped God. And during that period of time, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, separate Barnabas and Saul unto the work for which I have called them. And the Holy Spirit sent Paul and Barnabas off on this mission that would turn the world upside down. It was the, the launch of a whole new era of ministry. Um, God's reward may be an answer to your prayer. It may also be something that, that maybe you hadn't even intended. It may be that your Heavenly Father has something for you that He knows is going to bless you even more than your answer to prayer. So it may be an answer to prayer, but again, it, it isn't always. It may be something else that God uses, but He's going to reward you if you undertake this time of fasting and prayer. So I'll bring you back to the question. Will you join with myself and the rest of the Foursquare family in Canada for a week of fasting and prayer? I guarantee that if you do it with the right motive towards God, that it's going to be worth it. You may be looking ahead in this new year to new ventures. Maybe you're entering into a new period of studies in university or college, or maybe you're graduating from university or college this year and you're not sure what's going to happen yet, or, or maybe you do know and you just wanna pray for God's favor and God's grace over that big transition that's coming up. Maybe there's a new job that you're undertaking, or maybe there's some ministry undertaking that, that you're launching out on, something that you're looking forward to that, that you realize is going to be a big part of this year. And fasting is a way just to, to seek God for his favor on that whole process, the same as Nehemiah did in the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem. You might also have an area of your life where you need a breakthrough. Maybe there's discouragement and depression like Elijah, the prophet Elijah was facing, and you just want to be free from that. You want to want that broken over your life. Well, this is a way, again, to seek God for his help in that kind of a breakthrough. Or a lot of people, because of COVID and other things going on in our world, have experienced a lot of anxieties and a lot of fear. And if you want to be broken, if you want to break free from those things, have a, a kind of a breakthrough, then fasting is a great way to go about that. Maybe you want greater health for your body, either just to get stronger and healthier, or maybe it's an illness that you have that you need a breakthrough in. Fasting, again, is a way to seek God for that type of a breakthrough. Or maybe it's even a relationship problem and, and you want a breakthrough in your relationship. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe there's a relationship with one of your children that's not good or with your parent that's not good or with one of your friends that's not good and, and you want a breakthrough. Well, seek God for a breakthrough through fasting and he's going to reward you. You also just may simply be hungering for a deeper relationship with God. And like Moses, you wanna dwell there in the presence of God, just loving him, growing deeper in your intimacy with him. Or it may be that you felt distant from God for a long time and you want to have that sense of closeness once again. Well, fasting is one of the ways that you can pursue God for that intimacy, that closeness once again. So, coming back to the question, will you participate in Foursquare Canada's annual week of prayer and fasting? Your Heavenly Father wants to reward you for the right kind of attitudes and seeking Him through fasting. And I know that you'll be blessed if you do it. God bless you all. I am so grateful for the steady hand of good quality, godly leadership that we have with President Faulkner, our unit supervisors, and of course, from the Lord himself. We're in a good place uh, as we walk hand in hand with the Lord. Uh, I want to remind you to get your communion stuff ready right now. We're going to uh, begin to participate and celebrate communion together.
And as we said, we're going to do this every Sunday in January. And again, we have the elements of the bread and the body represented in our case by a cracker and the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus. The, the body, of course, is uh, and so, so significant on a Sunday like this when we're contemplating a unified partnership response because this represents the togetherness of the body of Christ made possible because Jesus' broken body made us whole. And so as you hold that little element in your hand not right now, we we take a moment to thank the Lord for the way he has knit us together uh, in, a, in a day and age in which divisiveness is so common and threatens in many cases to tear apart organizations, even the church. We are called scripturally to remain steadfast in our unity and love. And so we receive the broken body of Jesus, this emblem, to remind us of the commitment we've made to stay unified in love. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. Let's eat together. And then, of course, followed so beautifully by the emblem that represents the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. Talked about it last uh, week as the great distance uh, shrinker, the thing that takes distance away from our relationship with God. And we take this today and we drink it together today to remind us of the redemption and the restoration of the things that God is doing right now. And so we apply this, this uh, symbol uh, and in, in an inward manner, we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives again and again and again as we trust him to restore and reunite and redeem that which has been broken and lost. And so Jesus, now we receive this element of your shed blood with great thankfulness. Thank you for the new covenant that changed everything for us. And uh, we take this now and we receive your forgiveness and your unification again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's drink together. As we prepare to conclude, I'd like to uh, remind you that we invite the entire church, January 11th through 17th, that starts tomorrow. And uh, just as a, a thumbnail, so you might be asking, well, what, what am I praying and fasting for? Well, what we're believing for is really uh, fourfold. And so this can guide your prayers and your meditation as you uh, fast together. The first is for salvations. We are not satisfied with the amount of people coming to Jesus. We are partnering with God. <laughs> if, if you will, we're twisting God's arm a little bit to say, we are so serious about seeing the lost come to Jesus. We are willing to sacrifice something to show you our, our commitment here. We want to see the lost come home. Secondly, we are getting ready to launch our long-awaited discipleship video series, and we need God's covering over every aspect of that that this will be a ministry tool such as we've never engaged before, that all those precious people who come to know Jesus will be well discipled, even from a distance through this beautiful series. Thirdly, we're fasting for the 2021 budget of the church. Uh, we have a pandemic budget this year, which means it's very unpredictable, hard to nail down. We also are aware at the end of the year, we have a, a demand note alone that is, is due. It's a significant one. And we, have, we, we are depending on God to do a miracle in our finances. And of course, that starting place is our prayers, your participation in giving, and then the miraculous that God's going to bring. Finally, we need to find new ways to engage our community in the use of this building. We have been uh, given this wonderful resource and we need to steward well and we need to make those connections. So we're praying for our rental team uh, that they will find those connections, godly connections, not just from a business perspective, but a relational perspective that utilizes this building for theater groups, for more sports groups, so we can make connection with people to point them to Jesus. So there's some thumb note, thumbnail uh, a little thumbnail sketch of what you can be praying and fasting for this coming week. And then in uh, conclusion, all church prayer is this uh, coming Wednesday, the 13th at 7 p.m. It's hosted by Chris and Tina Getz. Uh, you can go to the website and uh, check the link that'll uh, link you via Zoom to that prayer meeting. And um, in, a, in, a, in a month in which we're contemplating the new things God is doing, we're going to kind of conclude the month in a couple of weeks with there's a new way to do things. In this new day, there is a new way to do things. Some of you, as soon as you hear the um, uh, uh, request to participate in all church prayer, you m immediately have thought historically, I'm not really a prayer. I don't do that kind of thing. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that. I want to challenge you. It's a new day. 
and there's a new way to do this. Perhaps your response would be, you know, despite my misgivings and my, my fears from the past, I am going to join with my church to pray like we've never prayed before. Church, if there was ever a moment, this is it. And so this coming Wednesday at 7, 7 p.m., go to the website, check the Zoom link, and we would love to have all church pray together. So God bless you. Thank you so much for being in church today. We love you. We believe that this is our time. God has orchestrated and guided us to this moment, and we believe that the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. It's good to see you. It's me, your friend Sarah. I've got Ready Teddy here, and we're going to sing some songs together. So make sure you're standing up, you have some room around you, and you're ready to go. We're going to learn a little bit of a new song now, and there's a very important part that I need your guys' help with. There's a part where we have to clap three times, and you can see Ready Teddy goes clap, clap, clap. And I'm going to need you guys to follow along with Ready Teddy, and I'll teach the song to you. It's talking about how God is always watching over us. He's always there for us. It goes like this. It says, God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. He's big and strong and loves us all. God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. Oh, good job, everybody. Let's do it one more time just for fun. We sing, God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. He's big and strong and loves us all. God is watching over us. Clap, clap, clap. Oh, good job, everybody. They did such a great job, didn't they, Ready Teddy? They did. Now we're going to sing a song about how God has all of us, the whole wild world, in his hands. So we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. And now I was thinking we could sing because this song says that he's got you and me and he's even got Ready Teddy in his hands. So we're going to sing that now. He's got you and me and Teddy. In his hands, he's got you and me and Teddy. In his hands, he's got you and me and Teddy. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Awesome, good job, everybody. It was so good to see you. Have fun, we'll see you next time. Hey guys, it's Kayla. And Emily. Stand, Stand up and, and join, join us in worship.
boys and girls. It's great to see you today. We have a fun and special story to share with you. We hope you enjoy. Hi, Jeffrey. Oh, hi, Miss Tina. Whoa, look at your hands. They're bigger. <laughs> hands are so awesome. They're perfect for clapping. Oh, yeah, and hands are perfect for oh, doing a high five. Yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, I know. Hands are perfect for catching a ball. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, 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 uh, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, hands are perfect for petting a dog. Pet, pet, <laughs> yes, pet, they pet, are. Pet, pet, pet. And hands are great for putting on my socks in the morning. Oh, that's good. Yeah, socks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, oh, uh, and, uh, oh, oh, how about peeling a banana? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, hands are great for that too. Mm -hmm. Yummy, I love bananas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. Miss Tina? Yes, Jeffrey? Well, this morning, when I was brushing my teeth, I, I, I dropped my toothbrush and it fell out of my hands onto the floor. Oh, no! Uh, Ew! Uh -huh. <laughs> One time, I was carrying my piece of toast to the table mm -hmm. on my plate, and I tripped, and suddenly my, my plate tipped over and my toast fell on the floor! Oh, no! <laughs> Breakfast everywhere. But I didn't eat it, though, because the jam was on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking this morning, about God's hands. Oh, I think God's hands would be bigger than yours, Miss Tina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you might be right. There's a Bible verse in Isaiah 41 verse 10, and it talks about God's hands and how he holds us safe. It says, do not be afraid. God is with you. He will make you strong and he will help you. God will hold you safe in his hands. He always does what is right. Huh. Why, Miss Tina, sometimes I feel afraid. Uh, I, I heard my mom on the phone the other day, and she was talking to my grandma, and, well, her grandma is sick. And oh. my mom, my mom was crying a little bit. Oh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it made me feel sad, too, and I want to help, but I don't know what to do. I feel really small sometimes. I feel small, too, sometimes, Jeffrey. Even though I'm bigger than you. Really? Yes. When I feel afraid or sad, sometimes I close my eyes when I pray, and I imagine myself sitting in God's hands, and He's holding me safe. Oh, I can do that. I bow my head and close my eyes, and... Oh, there I am. I'm sitting in God's hands. Oh, I do feel safe. <laughs> and you know what, Jeffrey? Well, what is it, Miss Tina? God is holding your grandma safe in his hands, too, and your mom. He cares for them so much, and he cares for you, too. Oh, thanks, Miss Tina. I feel happier thinking about that. I still wish I could do something to help my mom and my grandma. Oh, hi, Miss Tina. <laughs> hi, Jeffrey. I was thinking about hands again, and there's something you do with your hands every day that I know would help your mom and your grandma to feel better. Oh, what's that? Hands are great for coloring pictures. Oh, I could do that. I, I could draw a picture of puppy here. That would oh, be great. Oh, that sounds great, Jeffrey. Boys and girls, sometimes we all feel afraid or alone, and the Bible reminds us that God is with us. He gives us strength, He helps us, and He holds us safe in His hands. When you close your eyes to pray today, take a moment. And think about how you are sitting in God's hands. I think that will help you feel peaceful and happy and never alone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Hi, boys and girls. It's Miss Lauren here again. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to read another story with you. Won't you join me? Okay. This story is called, It Will Be Okay. All right. In a dusty shed on a rickety shelf, hidden in a cozy packet, lived a tiny seed. <laughs> day after day, little seed watched as the farmer came into the shed. The farmer's strong hand would reach into the packet and he would say, I have a good plan for you. Each time he selected a new seed. Little seed knew the farmer was good and kind but he did not want to leave his home in the packet. Little Seed liked living inside the cozy packet on the rickety shelf in the farmer's dusty shed. He did not want to go. 
in the nearby woods, under the big tall tree, in a comfy den lived a playful fox. Little fox raced around the tree, trunks in the woods. Yippee! He shouted with glee. But then a long black shadow scared him, and he hurried into his, to, into his den to hide. He was scared of the dark shadows and the howling winds and the rain <laughs> and most everything. Little fox liked his comfy den under the big tall tree in the nearby woods, but he did not like being afraid. Look at those shadows. Frighten him. Well, one particularly dark night, a storm rumbled into the forest. Thunder boomed. Lightning flashed. Rain poured onto Little Fox's den. Oh, no! Little Fox cried as he scurried through the woods, trying to find somewhere safe and dry and not scary. Oh, he barreled inside Farmer's dusty shed. He bumped into the rickety shelf. He knocked over the cozy seed packet. Uh-oh. And little seed rolled out onto the floor. Oh, dear. A surprised little fox found himself standing nose to nose with a very unhappy little seed. Uh, I'm Little Fox, and I live in the den under the big tall trees in the nearby woods, he explained. Y you see, I, I love to play in the woods, but I I'm afraid of dark shadows and, and howling winds, he said. There are no winds or shadows here in the shed. Can I please live here with you? Will you be my friend? Little Seed said, Hmm, do you see a pillow? Do you see a bed? Do you see a place for you to lay your head? No, you don't, because this safe place is the farmer's shed. But then Little Seed thought of how safe and warm it was inside the cozy packet, on the rickety shelf, in the farmer's dusty shed. He thought, maybe it would be nice to have a friend. Little Fox and Little Seed became the best of friends. Little Seed told silly stories. Little Fox made funny faces. Each day when the farmer came to the shed, Little Fox hid away. But the farmer was a good, and the farmer was a kind farmer. And the farmer was always watching over them, even when they didn't know it. Well, one morning... The farmer came back into the shed as he had on many days. Little seed, he said, as he placed him inside his hand. I have a wonderful plan for you. I have waited for just the right time. And today, little seed, is the day. Oh, no, please, no, I don't want to go, thought little seed. <sighs> but you know, that farmer is good and kind. He's a good farmer, he's a kind farmer, and he has a plan for that little seed. I wonder if little seed needs to try and trust him to not worry. And you know, boys and girls, that's just like God in our lives. God has a plan for each of us. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for your mummies and your daddies. He has a plan for your brothers and sisters. God has a plan for us all, and we just need to maybe trust God. We'll read the second part of the story another time.